Uh, take your Bible out now. Let's go ahead and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21. We're going to pick up back up right where we left off. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. Uh, I'll pick up in verse 5 and read there in just a moment. And what I want to share with you tonight is this. There will be disturbing turmoil. Y'all know How many of y'all know what turmoil is? How many of y'all have experienced turmoil in your life? All right, you know what I'm talking about. There will be disturbing to- turmoil, persecution for Christians, earthquakes, plagues, and famines until the day that Jesus Christ returns to earth. And all God's people said, I thought you were going to say I already knew that, but if you didn't know that, I'm glad that you do know that now. Let's go ahead and dive in, read the scriptures, and then I'll back up and and, and just add a little bit uh, in exposition towards what we read tonight. Starting in chapter 21, verse 5, as some were talking about the temple complex, how it was adorned uh, with beautiful stones and uh, and gifts uh, dedicated to God, he said, these things that you see, the day will come when no stone will be left one on another that will not be thrown down. And then Jesus rolls right into this end of the age thing he's going to talk about. Teachers, they said to him, so when will these things happen? When will they be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said to them, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is near. Don't follow them when you hear of wars and rebellions, but don't be, don't be alarmed. Indeed, these things must take place first. But the end won't come right away. It will not be yet, in other words. Verse 10, then he told them, nation will be raised up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be violent earthquakes the famines and plagues in various places and there will be terrifying sights and great signs from heaven. But before all of these things, they will hide their hands on you and persecute you and they will hand you over to the synagogue and to the prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. It will lead to an opportunity for you to witness. Therefore, make up your mind, uh, make up your minds not to prepare your defense ahead of time. For I will give you such words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will even be betrayed by parents brothers, relatives, and friends, they will kill some of you. You will be hated by everyone because of my name. But not a hair on your head will be lost, but your endur- by your endurance gain your lives. Going on, it says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that this desolation has come near. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those inside the city must leave and those who are in the country must not enter it because these are the days of the vengeance to fulfill all the things that were written. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days for there will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be laid captive into all the nations in Jerusalem will be trampled under the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Then there will be a sign in the sun, moon, and stars. And there will be anguish on earth among the nations bewildered by the roaring sea in the way. People will faint from fear an expectation of the things that are coming on the world because the celestial powers will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory. But when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. And all God's people said, did that text carry you to death? It really should have. I mean, let you kind of know some of the things are going to take place. Um, What I need for you to understand is Jesus is talking to his disciples. And as he is talking to his disciples, he's talking about things that are fixing to happen. Y'all know what fixing means, don't you? Preparing to get ready. 
I mean, they're preparing to get ready for what's fixing to happen right then. Okay, but some of the stuff he talks about is going to happen right then, and some of that stuff is going to happen well over 2,000 years later. We know it's going to be 2,000 years later because we've seen that it hasn't happened yet. Okay, it's a fact. It is an absolute fact that Jesus Christ is coming back. It is not a fact that an earthquake, plagues, uh, 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 plague of, or famine is a sign of the coming that is coming soon. Let me say that again. It is a fact that Jesus is coming back, but because there are a plague is not a sign that Jesus is coming back today. Because there is an earthquake on the face of the earth does not mean that Jesus Christ is coming back tomorrow because the earthquake is there. Jesus said there will be persecution, earthquakes, famines, plagues, but the end is not yet. Okay, so that's not the end. It's, it's, it, it lets you know that things are shaken up, but it's not the end. His point is the world will continue to be plagued by the curse of sin. By the way, you do remember when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they sinned, Adam was cursed because he sinned and he had to work by the sweat of his brow and, and to work in the ground there would be thorns and thistles. Eve was cursed and her passion would be for her husband and there would be sorrow in childbirth. But do you also remember that the earth was cursed and when the earth was cursed, the earth now has all kinds of shaking and quaking and all of those things going on in it that God didn't intend for it to have. His point here is the world will continue to be plagued by this curse of sin that's on it until the day that Jesus Christ makes his return and then when he returns, everything is going to be fixed and there will be no more earthquakes, there will be no more plagues, there will be no more famines, there will be no more things like that because everything will be as it should be. Now tonight, we're going to look at Jesus' his discourse with his disciples and talk about what they could expect until his return. Now remember, some of these things are talking about something that's fixing to happen quick for them and some of these things are going to happen that have not yet happened in our lives and some of them are actually happening all around us right now. Number one thing that he talks to them about, he says this, there, they, they were to know that there would be False Christ. Everybody say false Christ. False Christ. There were going to be people who would come and say that they were Christ. Right after Jesus' death, there were a number of men who stepped up and said, well, you know, I'm the Messiah. Jesus Christ wasn't the Messiah, but I'm the Messiah. And I wasn't there for that. Brother Ken, were you there for that the first century after Jesus? Was born? Okay, all right. You, you really didn't come off the, the ark. Okay, I'm, I'm getting that now. Okay, he's not quite that old, but... Uh, uh, I know that in my lifetime I have seen many men who claim to be Jesus Christ himself and not a single one of them was. And, and just, uh, you know, think in your head, how many of y'all can remember? Y'all remember a guy by the name of Sun Young Moon? Uh, he died in 2012 and he was convinced and tried to convince all kinds of people that he was the Messiah himself, but he died and is no longer here. Then there was a guy by the name of Jim... Jones. Okay, how many of y'all remember Jim Jones? We're going back to 1978 on this. Jim Jones had the People's Temple, and in 1978 in Jamestown in uh, Ghana, he, he, he caused his people to follow him into death by drinking the Kool-Aid. And then uh, the younger ones in here may remember 1973. How many of y'all were big enough to remember 1973? How many of you are young enough to remember 1973? Okay, sometimes we forget. There was a place, a, a city in Texas. Y'all remember what it was? Waco, Texas. Who was, what was the guy's name? David Koresh. And he claimed to be the Messiah himself. You know that there's a couple of guys on the face of the earth right now who are claiming to be the Messiah. One of them is David Schaller, S-H-A-Y-L-E-R. And a, a, a currently... He, uh, uh, David is, uh, or he, he was formerly an MI5, I think I got that right, an MI5 agent. Well, Y'all know who James Bond is? 
007. All right, they've got, you know, we, we've got the secret service. We've got the, the, the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States. And then there's the MI5s over in, uh, in uh, Great Britain. And these are the guys that are highly intelligent or, or manipulating all the things in the world. And he decided a few years ago that he was the Messiah. He claimed, I am the Messiah and I hold the secrets to eternal life. And that, and that he has been going around trying to explain to people that he's been reincarnated and he knows all all of these things that have come from God and he is a man of super high intelligence. He just blows the, uh, blows the scales off when he talks about how smart he is but yet he thinks that he is the son of God. Is he? He's not. He's not. Okay, and then another one uh, which was in 2011. He broke into the White House with a gun and he tried to shoot Barack Obama claiming that he was the uh, he, that he was uh, the, uh, the son of God. He had an automatic weapon in his hand. His name was Romero Artego Hernandez is what his name is. And I just say that to say that as long as we exist, there are going to be those people who are going to come and they're going to try to make you think that they are the Messiah. And the reason I know that they're going to come until Jesus comes back is because Jesus said, they would. Every generation has at least one or two people who claim to be that. Now we could, I could go and say Jesus said that there would also be wars on the face of the earth. And just out of curiosity, how many wars have we the people in here seen? I know some of you in here were here for World War I. I don't think any, I mean World War II. I don't think we have anybody left alive that was here for World War Brother Ken, were you at World War I? Okay, World War II. Okay, Brother Kim served in during Korea. In fact, anybody else serve in Korea uh, in, in the Korean War? Okay, got a couple who served in the Korean War. And then after that, what was that war that came right behind that? Vietnam. How many Vietnam people we got? To, okay, got several in here that served in Vietnam. And then we also have had, had many more wars, but we had, uh, what was the 1980 war? Desert Storm, that we, we call Desert Storm. And then there's just, uh, uh, what, what were some of the others that we've seen? Yeah, you know, all of these wars. It seems like the Middle East is always on the verge of a war. And the reason it seems like they're always on the verge of a war is because they are always on the verge of war. But it's always been, ever since Jesus left the face of the earth, there have been wars and there have been rumors of wars and there will continue to be wars and there will continue to be rumors of wars because man is cursed, the earth is cursed, the women are cursed, we're all cursed, so they're going to exist. Another thing Jesus said, there will be earthquakes. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I listen, you know, I get these bolos from Fox News and WLOX and all these phones on my telephone. I don't watch as much news as I used to. I just get the bolos and kind of get the, the heads up information on there. But I did notice that last week there was an awful lot of earthquakes. I wrote this on this past Thursday morning, early in the morning, and as of last Thursday morning, so when I say in the last six days, that was the last six days from Thursday morning, so that would be the last nine days now, but I didn't add any of the new ones. These places have experienced an earthquake in the last six days from when I wrote this. Nicaragua, Colombia, California, South Korea, Uganda, Alaska, Oklahoma, and, and some parts of the South have experienced an earthquake in the last six days of our existence, ranging from 2.2 to, to 6 point something on the Richter scale. So those, those earthquakes are always there, and they're going to continue to be there because everything is all so messed up that are there. But Jesus said that they would be there. But he also said that there would be famines and that there would be uh, 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 plagues to come on. Is there any disease that you might be afraid of catching right now? The Zika virus. It's out there and, and, and people are worried about, you know, especially your, your older. There's always some kind of new disease that's morphing itself and coming out and causing people to die along the way. And then I'm told that by the researchers that in the next few years, the Horn of Africa, because of the temperature changes and the weather patterns that have changed, they're going to experience a tremendous famine on the Horn of Africa down south of there. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, false messiahs, all of those are coming to, to, to let us know that things are just getting ready 
for Jesus Christ to come back. They have always been since Jesus left, and they always will be when Jesus comes back. Now, how many of you know that the last book of the Bible is named Revelation? Okay, all y'all know that. How many of y'all have ever tried to read the book of Revelation? How many of y'all completely, totally, 100% understand it? Okay, don't have to call anybody a liar. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad. Uh, you know, there's a blessing for the man or the woman who reads that book, but I can promise you when you get through reading it, no matter how many times you read it, you're still not going to understand it. There's this correlation between the scriptures that I read tonight and chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. In chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, it, reads, it talks about some horses. It talks about a white horse, talks about a black horse, talks about a green horse, talks about a red horse along the way. And I just want to share some of what it says in Revelation. So Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. Do I have that to throw up on the screen, Revelation 6 4? This is the first one I want to show to you. It's about the red horse. Everybody say red horse. I just want to see if y'all say red horse. Then another horse went out a fiery red one, and its horseman was empowered to do what now? When you take peace from the earth, what are you putting in its place? War, okay? You see the correlation between those? And its horseman was empowered to take peace from the earth so the people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. All right, this is, this is what's happening. In the meantime, while Jesus is gone, all of these wars are taking place. Don't, you know, the time is not yet. But know that there will be global unrest as far as wars and nations and nations fighting against nation until Jesus Christ comes back. And then he begins to talk about a black horse. Everybody say black horse. I think I got a black horse scripture. Can I throw that black horse scripture up there? Revelation chapter 6 verses... Uh, Five and six, here, okay, got the black horse. When he opened the third seal, I heard uh, the third living creature say, come, and I will look, and there will be a what? A black horse. The horseman on it has a set of scales in his hand. Then I heard someone like the voice among the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a Daenerys. Now, a Daenerys is a day's wages. Okay, how much is a quart? Somebody help me. Is that the quarter? Is this the quarter? Your quarter's that, isn't it? That's what you get. Yeah, yeah. That's what, you know, it's about this big. A day's wages. But you know what causes that to happen? Famine in the land. A famine in the land will cause that because then the prices of whatever exists go exorbitantly. Then I heard someone say, uh, uh, the living creatures, a quarter wheat for Daenerys and three quarts of barley for Daenerys. But do not harm the olive oil and the wine. In other words, there's going to be a famine in the land, not going to destroy everything. But until Jesus Christ comes back from place to place, there's going to be various famines that are going to go out throughout the land. Okay? Even here in the United States of America, y'all remember just studying your history books. I don't think anybody was around here for that. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But we had the Dust Bowl in the teens. Wasn't that in the teens? His, some history people helped me out with that. I think that was the late teens when we experienced that. I overformed and we had the drought come through and all of that. Then uh, Revelation goes on and it talks about a green horse. Everybody say green horse. <laughs> okay. I, I looked and there was a pale green horse. And the, ho and the horseman on it was named, what? Death and Hades, and was following after him. Authority was given him over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, by famine, and by plague, and the wild animals of the earth. See, there's always going to be a plague on the face of the earth. There's always going to be a famine on the earth. There's always going to be some new disease that's going to come up and take people's lives because sin has come to the world. Now, I disagree with some theologians, so I didn't put this one on here, but there's actually a white horse who's mentioned first in chapter 6. Some theologians say that the white horse is the gospel going out and being preached while all of these other horses are out there, but then there are a series of people who say, a series of theologians who say that is not actually Christ on the white horse that's going out, but it is false Christ going out and doing what they are doing. But actually, you know, that would mimic the picture that Jesus said that since that is a false Christ, that would be false Messiah. You see, you see the marriage between these two set of texts right here? To let us know that while we're living, while we're in the age of the Gentiles, while the church is here, this is what we're going to experience in our lives. 
No, there's going to be an earthquake. No, there's going to be a famine. No, there's going to be a war. But know that the gospel has got to go out and know there will be false people to come and try to, to convince you of things that are not true. Third thing I want to pull from the scripture and talk about is there will be persecution for the saints by the world. The world is absolutely going to persecute Christians. How many of you have either seen on a video or seen something on the news about the Christians in the Middle East who are being beheaded because of their faith in Jesus Christ? Just out of curiosity, let me take a poll right here. This is a poll. You, this is your opinion. You don't have to, you know, you can answer however you want to. How many of you believe that sooner or later on the face of the earth, uh, sooner or later, excuse me, sooner or later here in the United States, if we continue on the path that we are in, we will see followers of Jesus Christ, their lives taken from them because they actually believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, but, okay, that, we can see it's coming. We, we can see it unless the course has changed. I, do y'all think that's way off or do you think that's close? And my opinion is it is very, very close. So there will be persecution for the saints. My, by the way, how many saints we got in here? Okay, I'm not talking about the football team, Okay. <laughs> Because there's not even a Saints team this year, is there? <laughs> That's up for debate, okay? All right. I didn't mean to go there. I shouldn't have gone there on that one. All right, but while I'm talking about born-again believers of Jesus Christ, as saints, we're going to experience persecution if they, uh, sooner or later when the climate gets that way. The world will kill saints. He doesn't want them on the face of the earth because Satan wants to destroy everyone because every saint that is on the earth has one mission. Y'all know what your mission is? Why, why are you here on the face of the earth? To, to disciple or to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. And how does Satan feel about that? If he can get you dead, when you're dead, you can't teach anybody. You can't tell them about Jesus when you're dead. So he's coming after you. He's coming to try to get you. Saints will be given words to say. Now, this is some beautiful information that comes from Jesus. Jesus tells those disciples, and in this time, I think he's speaking to them particularly for the situations coming to them, but it's a truth that is also true for you. Our job is to know the word and to study the word. And uh, these guys, in just a few short years, they were going to see the city of Jerusalem collapse and fall down, and people were going to be put to death, as we talked about in the message this morning. But he was saying to them, they're going to come and they're going to take you away. And when they take you away, they're going to put you to death. But when the time comes for you to speak up, don't worry about preparing a speech because the Holy Spirit is going to take the scriptures that you've been studying and it's going to give you what you need to say. And you're going to speak in such a powerful way that everybody who hears what you say is actually going to know that you're speaking the truth and they are causing the lie to take place. So there is power in that testimony of that saint who is dying. Now, saints will profess Jesus Christ as Lord unto death. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. Saints will profess Jesus Christ as Lord even unto death. Had a had a, a odd question come to me uh, two weeks ago in my in my email. It was a great question. It was odd, but it was it was it was great. And it, I guess it's not really odd given the climate that we live in. And they're they're thinking they want to know if, if if we get persecuted here in the United States and somebody puts a gun up to our head or somebody says they're going to cut our throat or and we have to confess that Jesus is Lord and we don't confess that Jesus is Lord, will we die and go to hell? And the answer to that question is yes. Because every believer must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now by that I want to I also want to say you don't have to run into a burning building. You don't have to jump in an airplane, fly over to uh, Iran, walk up to the Ayatollah Khomeini and say, I believe in Jesus. Okay? That's, that, that's, that's when I say jumping, jumping into a burning building. That's what I'm talking about. But if you get backed up and they say to you, you got to confess that Jesus is Lord and if you do, we're going to kill you. If you are a born-again believer of Jesus Christ, do not worry. Words will be given you and you will speak and not a hair on your head will be lost. But don't misunderstand me. That doesn't mean you won't die. It just means a hair on your head won't be lost. You may lose your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ and you are required to lose your life for the gospel of Jesus Christ in that situation 
But to remember to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when you're there, everything then will be as it should be. But I also understand this. Jesus was telling him, you know, your family's going to think you're crazy. There are going to be people in your family think, think you're crazy. When I called daddy, I was going to the member ministry. He said, well, more power to you. You know, I mean, I think he, he, thought, he thought I was crazy. I remember Tynell's daddy, well, he wanted to sit me down. He wanted to ask me where my check coming from. How are you going to eat? How are you going to do this? Now, now that I'm an old man and a father-in-law and all those kind of things, I understand why he asked me all those questions, you know? But sometimes your family doesn't understand what's taking place, but uh, you gotta, you got to confess that Jesus is Lord, however he tells you. So sometimes you got to go and tell your family, well, God has sent me to be a, a missionary in Africa. You know, i got to go. Your family say, are you crazy? Maybe. But I know God's calling me to go and do this. you got to do it. Uh, saints will be given the words that they need to have wherever God sends them to witness to whomever it is that God intends for them to witness to because it's just what we do. We will persevere by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, as the book of Revelation says. Okay, fourth thing I want to pull from this is Jerusalem will be destroyed. Now, we know, as we read in the text this, this morning, and we studied it a little bit at the morning of, that Jerusalem falls in 70 A.D. So when Jesus is telling his disciples, specifically he is saying, pray that this doesn't come in winter time because the women who are carrying babies are going to have a really rough time trying to get out of Jerusalem. I think he was speaking ex exactly of that event right there when that place would fall. So that was a message to them, but it wasn't necessarily a message to us today, but it was a message to them. Jerusalem experienced that. Jerusalem was wiped off the face of the earth and it never came back into existence until 1948 and became another nation. Now, if you're a dispensationalist, you put a lot in that. If you're not, you, you understand that it was not God that brought that nation back together again. It was men who brought that nation together after World War II. And God's going to do what God's going to do. He's going to work things out in his way, in his time. And it all has a part in the master plan. But that was man who decided that that should happen. Fifth truth we're going to pull from the text tonight is this. Jesus' glorious return will shake the heavens and the earth. It will shake the heavens. Well, the scripture that we read, well, let me read the scripture again that came from Luke 20, 21, 25. It says, then there will be signs in the, there will be a sign in the sun, the moon, and the stars. In other words, you're going to see uh, everything is going to get messed up. You, you know, we exist because we rotate around the sun and because the moon rotates around us and affects everything. When Jesus Christ comes back, all that's falling to pieces. I mean, there's going to be, you, you know, you see all the time where there's some meteor on a movie coming to destroy the United States of America and it's going to land and we got to get in these boats and go live in Iceland or someplace like that. Hey, that's going to happen. Something like it's going to, only we're not getting a boat to go live in Iceland. We're going to be with Jesus Christ because he's going to take care of us because we belong to him. That's the reason we don't fear what happens in the future because we don't trust in governments and we don't trust in our political officials. Who do we trust in? Jesus, the name of the Lord our God. Sixth thing is, Jesus' return will bring redemption. It'll, it'll cast out that sin that's on the face of the earth. It'll cast out that sin that's in you. It'll cast out the sin that's in all other people. But when these things uh, begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. In other words, we win. Sin is vanquished. Uh, how many of y'all are affected by sin? How many of y'all, you don't have to raise your hand on this because I want to get too personal. But how many of you have a problem with your own sin? Okay. Now, and listen to it. How many of you have a problem with everybody else's sin too? It affects every one of us. But when Jesus Christ comes back, everything will be as it should be because there will be a, a new earth and a new heaven and the new heaven will come down to earth and then everything will be as it should be. And I'm not going to sit down here and give you dates and times and tell you when all of these things are going to take place because God has seen fit for me not to know that. I go back to what dear old Adrian Rogers said. He's not on the planning committee. He's on the welcoming committee. I'm not planning how Jesus is coming back. I'm just welcoming people into the kingdom until he comes back, okay? That's our job. Okay, one, uh, all things that are imperfect will be made perfect and everything will be as it should be. Uh, 
So what do we do with the message? What's our application points? I came up with four. I've only got three on the overhead, one I added a while ago. Number one, trust God through the turmoil of life. Isaiah said in chapter 40, verse 10, see, the Lord God comes with strength. And his power establishes his rule, and he rewards, his reward is with him, and his gifts accompany him. God's going to take care of you until Jesus Christ comes back. And when Jesus Christ comes back, nothing else is going to matter because everything's going to be made like it is. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough trouble of its own. Just be who you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus today because it's going to be all right. And you worry about the joy of the Lord. You know, where does God's joy come from? God's joy comes from you being who you're supposed to be in Christ. And when you're who you're supposed to be in Christ, then God fills you up with his strength. And you can deal with whatever he brings you to. He will give you the strength to see you through until that point in time in your life. Don't fear that Jesus Christ is coming back. Look forward to it. Which brings me to the second truth is this. Look forward to Jesus' return with gleeful expectation. Now I know, you know, I've had, for some of you, I've had conversations, you know, you say things like, I can't even look forward to Jesus Christ coming back because I got loved ones in my own family that are not saved. I understand that, I do. You're not looking forward because they're not going to make it, but you're looking forward to finally, at last, the earthquakes will stop. At last, the wars will quit. At last, there will be no more famines. At last, there will be no more uh, messiahs who claim to be Jesus Christ. Revelation 21, 3 and 4 says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Lord, or look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will, listen to this, wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief is gone. Crying, eh, not tears of joy, but crying because of anguish, it's gone. In pain, it exists no more. How many of y'all hurt? It's gone. It's gone. And pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. God has made everything new. Third, third truth or third application to this is work while you can. You know, there's only so many hours of daylight, then it'll be dark. It's going to be dark before too long. Jesus will be here. We do have loved ones that need to know Jesus. We do have a nation that needs to know about Jesus. John chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, we must do the work of him who sent us while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world, Jesus said. You know what? As long as you're in the world, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. There's somebody you need to be witnessing to. And get, get this. The hard cases... It's the ones that it's hard for them to come to know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, they're not going to get saved with a gospel presentation that's 10 minutes long. They're going to get saved when you show them how true the Bible is. And when you take the Bible and you lay it side by side with life and you start discipling them through it, they're going to come to the conclusion that God is real. I'm reminded of the man that I think he wrote, Ben Hur, and I can't remember what his name was, not my sermon notes, just a thought that popped across my head. You know, when he wrote that movie and wrote the book, Ben Hur, before the movie, he had made one decision. He was an atheist and he went to read the Bible so that he could prove that the Bible was a lie. And while he was reading the Bible, guess what happened? He figured out it was the truth. And, of course, everybody originally knows it's the truth. It's the truth. Whether you believe the truth is the truth or not. So he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Fourth one that I don't have an overfed head for. Know that in our current situation in the United States of America, without any changes, persecution is a very predictable 
It's possible that somebody would say, you must profess Christ or be put to death. If you don't believe in Jesus, you'll tell everybody then. But you know what I have found, though? Anybody can say Jesus is Lord, but not everybody can die. And what I mean by that is a lot of people that I've known through the years who would confess that Jesus is Lord, when it came time for them to die, they were scared to death. But those of great faith, when it's time for them to die, they say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Dear God in heaven, powerful spirit.